This program is designed to provide general information with regards to the subject matters covered. This information is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, sponsors, or station are engaged in rendering any specific and personal medical, financial, legal, counseling, professional service, or any advice. You should seek the services of competent professionals before applying or trying any suggested ideas. Hey there, it's Brian Tash, Cuba News and more, live around the world as usual, talk or media, K4HD radio podcasting, over 100 streaming sites around the world and counting. And today's a special show because we start our third season officially today. We're on season number three, Tosh, Terry. Congratulations to everyone. Yes. So with this, I want to kick off everything because now we're at almost 1.5 million on our YouTube channel. They're at 15 million plus and counting on all, all streaming platforms right now, which is great. I couldn't be happy. I couldn't have done it without the help of everybody. So, I got to start off with this. All right. So, Terry Marie and Nonstop from Redondo Beach, California. Locally, Tosh from Miami, Florida. Howard Pickens, I think, is coming on. He's from Nashville, Tennessee. I got to start with Margaret because she's all the way in the London, UK. And with that, Margaret, I'm going to have to kick it off. But Lisa Skinner, thank you for coming in from Northern California. And L'Oreal and David, right? Sunrise, uh, Sunrise Mountain. I love this brand, and I was talking to Petri about you guys today. So with this, Margaret, let's kick this off with you. Tell us who you are, where you come from, and why you're on movie reviews and more. Okay, hi, Brian. Thank you very much to invite me. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Margaret Thorley. I'm based in the UK. I'm a business coach and a mentor and uh, our organization, HMI Training Professionals and Let's Change Your Life with Margaret Thorley. We specialize working with single fathers and married and lone parents. So that's what we're currently doing in the UK. Lisa Skinner, you got one of these world famous books that I really, really like. Talk about that because mentor, very, very important. It's not the way. It's all about mental health, and Margaret knows that too, right, Lisa? Thank you. Um, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. So, I have a very unusual profession. I am what's called what we call a behavior specialist. And my expertise is in Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. There are actually over 100 brain diseases that cause dementia, Alzheimer's being the most common one. And I um, have been doing this for about 30 years. And at the urging of my clients, when I had my own consulting firm, um, people actually encouraged me to write a book because... Uh, they found the knowledge that I have in my brain and through experience to be very helpful to a lot of families who are struggling through this heartbreaking disease. And they said, you really need to write a book. I had one client tell me, it would be selfish of you to not share what you know, because there aren't that many people that can provide the resources that you have. And she was right. So um, that's I mean, I'd been thinking about it for years, but that's finally when I decided to pull that trigger and, and put the, the pen to paper and start raising awareness about this disease, which is um, critical. It really is. More people need to have a better understanding of the disease. And yeah, not all who wonder need to be lost, right? That was my first book. And then there's a newer version called truth lies and alzheimer's it's secret faces and that one um, actually has a training program 
uh, with it and a workbook. So uh, people can actually learn the techniques that I teach through this training program. Loyal and David, talk about this. Talk about why I like your company so much. Why specifically like Pacifica for my 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 colleague Montague Pope Lebeau because that's the only brand that helps him. Talk about your company. Why Sunrise Mountains is important because I love your brand. I like what you guys are doing. And it's not easy being a mom and pop, is it? No, it's not easy being a mom and pop. You know, uh, being entrepreneurs, it's you know you do a lot. <laughs> we wear a lot of hats, but we love what we do. Uh, we've been cultivating cannabis for a few decades, actually, for quite a while, just a very, very small scale for ourselves and our own medical needs or benefit. But um, yeah, so we now have a commercial business in California. We have a small regenerative farm in Northern California in Humboldt County, and we grow flowers, which we make some concentrates. We have a tincture that's called Pacific. And that tincture, it's a two to one CBD to THC. So like two parts CBD, one part THC. And it has a different, it has a spectrum, a wide spectrum of cannabinoids in it. It's in a kind of pure form, um, unadulterated form. And so it's very pure, really get the uh, essence of the plant. And it's uh, very um, helpful for a lot of people and ailments that people have. So we've been getting really great feedback about that particular product, which is basically this one cultivar that we uh, you know, did on our farm and found that the cannabinoids and the terpenes in it are highly medically beneficial for people. And um, and then there's other strains that we grow too. There's other cultivars that we grow. So we have uh, we are cultivators and we have a brand in California. And um, we feel really blessed to be doing what we're doing. We love what we do. Yeah, I really like the tinctures because um, I can't smoke. I have asthma, so I just can't do any kind of smoke. Um, but they really help. I'm going through like my mom's going through some health health issues, um, and it's to deal with my anxiety. That's what's helping me sleep. <laughs> to tell you the truth, it helps me sleep too. Oh, actually, yeah. the Pacific tincture. I've had a lot of feedback from customers and people and people in our community. Uh, people are really finding it helps them sleep, and actually, that's mostly what I use it for. I also use it just to calm my nervous system down at times. Or we have three kids, so you know, in the evening, I'll take a little bit sometimes to help quiet my nervous system occasionally if I need that. But mostly for sleep, it just really is um, just that combination of compounds that are in this particular cultivar that we grow is excellent for sleep and. I have some friends that are connoisseurs and they've tried all different all different cannabis strains and different medicines and they're like keep coming back to ours so that's great yeah um, it's it's after taking you know trying to take the you know, sleeping pills either prescription or over the counter um and even anxiety drugs like i just don't do well with them i just like i don't like the way i feel in the morning and with cannabis and with the cbd oils you know, so you get a calm sleep. You don't feel icky in the morning. It just, it's just, it's, I think it's just better to go natural with everything than you than rely on pharmaceuticals. I've always had better luck with the natural cures. Yeah. That's the beauty of cannabis is that it's, you know, our bodies have receptors within it that are made to take what we're putting in and work uh, within our physiology Whereas you're taking the over-counter of the drugs, they're, I mean, they're, they're not part of our physiology. They're not supposed to be part of our physiology. So our bodies have a counter reaction to that. And so with cannabis medicine, we're putting medicine in our body that our body's made to take in. So it makes a big difference. Well, Lisa, talk about this. I've been talking to a lot of people on the East Coast, um, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, on mental health. And... People are doing a lot of things. This goes for you too, Margaret, because I know what you do in the UK on things. A lot of people are like really stressed out when I'm stressed out. And it's kind of tough to see a lot of more mental problems happening. Lisa, when you wrote your book and you're talking about what you're seeing and people wanted you to talk about this, 
tell us why that was important that you wrote that. Because I know why you wrote it. Tell us why you wrote it. My very first experience with Alzheimer's disease dates back 50 years when my grandmother started displaying some pretty strange behaviors. I was a teenager at the time and I only lived a couple miles from her and I started, I, I was close with her. I, I visited her regularly. I grew up with her and I, when I visited her just kind of out of nowhere, she would start telling me about these birds that lived inside her mattress and would come out at night and peck at her face. And then she would um, describe these rats that were invading her home and she could see them running along the walls. And she said that men were breaking into her home, stealing her jewelry and trying to harm her. And what she was telling me obviously sounded pretty far fetched, but I grew up uh, being um, conditioned, I guess you could say that you don't contradict your elders, you don't argue with them, and you they're the ultimate top of the respect chain. So I didn't quite know how to respond to these just unbelievable things she was telling me. I even went to the extreme of going into her bedroom, leading her in there, say, okay, grandma, we're going to look and see where these birds are coming from. I lifted up her mattress, expecting to see a hole in there and feathers or whatever. There was nothing. So I said to her, I said, show me how they're getting out. Where are they coming from? I'm not seeing anything. And her response to me was absolutely brilliant. She said, oh, they're there, but they're very clever. <laughs> you know, now fast forward 50 years and I've been doing this professionally for 30. Um, they learn how to cover up for things that they believe are true. So I have since then had seven more family members uh, develop one of the brain diseases that causes dementia. <clears throat> and one of the things that I that has been consistent throughout my career is that people are not willing to talk about this disease until very recently, maybe just in the last couple of years. And they don't have a comprehensive understanding about what this disease does to people. And a lot of people don't even the two, the two together, that these behaviors that we see, hallucinations and delusions and false beliefs, personality changes, are actually part of the disease. Most people associate Alzheimer's disease with short-term memory loss and confusion. And I've had people actually say to me, yeah, my, my mom has dementia, but she's also now crazy. And to be honest with you, Alzheimer's disease is not mental health. This is not a mental health disease. This is mm -hmm. a physical disease mm -hmm. that destroys brain cells. And as a person is progressing through it, they lose eventually almost all of their cognitive abilities. They lose their memories. They lose their ability to judge. They lose their ability to reason. And eventually they're left helpless. Somebody's going to have to do everything for them. And it's kind of like the elephant in the room where it just is there all the time and it doesn't go away, but it's larger than life. So working with thousands of families over the years, and I've noticed this consistent theme of lack of knowledge and lack of understanding, I decided that I was going to dedicate my life to raising awareness about this disease. And one of the reasons that I feel so strongly about it, not just because I've had eight family members live with it, but I've also worked with family members for almost 30 years. And I know, according to the um, World Health Organization, the Alzheimer's Association, the number of people who are projected to develop Alzheimer's disease, and I'm just talking Alzheimer's disease, 
not the other brain diseases that cause dementia, which are very similar, but the projected number of people who are who will develop Alzheimer's disease worldwide by the year 2050 are going to triple. Wow. We're talking millions and millions and millions of people that will live with this disease. And I can tell you this quite honestly, we are not prepared. This is going to be like the next global pandemic. And due to COVID, a lot of families are now caring for their loved ones in their homes versus sending them to assisted living. And the care burden on people with disease is just measureless. It's a 24 hour, seven day a week job and it is so stressful, but it doesn't necessarily have to be stressful. Um, there are very strategic and specialized skills that people can learn to provide a better quality life for people living with this disease. And that's what I teach people. So it's basically just a matter of raising awareness because so many families are not only struggling with it today, but the amount of families that are going to be involved with somebody, have a loved one, or caring for somebody with Alzheimer's disease, um, those numbers are tripling in the next 25, 30 years. So I think it's kind of a scary situation that I don't think anybody's really prepared for. Not yeah, I have, I have a question because my mom is like, has poor health. She's got congestive heart failure. Um, I'm just noticing like her, she's angry, really, really angry. And I'm thinking some of the oxygen is not getting to her brain that which is causing her to be in denial about a lot of stuff. Cause it's like things to me where like she thinks things that I think that she needs to fix, let's say messes in the house or, or clutter. She's not seeing it as a problem. There's a lot of denial going on. And I don't know if it's because she's not getting enough oxygen to her brain because she's on oxygen now all the time, or if it's early state of Alzheimer's, like how do you know the difference or is it, or does a health condition like that have effects or start the early stages of Alzheimer's? You know what I'm saying? Because she's there, but she's just really angry. It's more of a denial thing. So how do you recognize if it's an attitude or like, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what it is. <laughs> so what no, is that on? is um, an excellent question. And you are kind of right on the money because there are a, a number of risk factors that kind of go into the bucket to increase a person's risk of developing Alzheimer's. There are some risk factors that we call modifiable and some that are non-modifiable. The non-modifiable risks are age. That's the number one cause of, or risk for developing Alzheimer's. You can't do anything about your age, your gender, um, your ethnicity, but the number one modifiable risk for developing Alzheimer's disease is a heart condition, is heart disease. And you just said your mom had it. So- Actually has, she's got congestive heart failure. That yeah. she's, she's slowly dying. I mean, it's not curable. She's 84, but I'm just seeing her brain as her heart, as she's going on oxygen now, because she can't function without an oxygen tank. I'm seeing it, her deteriorate more on her, on her denial about reality. Yeah. My father suffered from congestive mm -hmm. heart failure too. And he ended up developing um, dementia. Uh, later on, he was about 84 when we really started noticing the signs. But no, that is that is a risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease is having heart disease that's either, you know, advancing in stages or not being treated through medication or oxygen or something like that. But what you're saying, you have a very valid point. It could definitely be causing the symptoms you're seeing, contributing to the symptoms you're seeing, it's uh, they're they're all interrelated. So, um, is she still able to do things for herself, or um, she's got two weak, two bad knees? Um, not really. She can't really get around very well. I'm talking about in, in terms of functioning, um, kind of 
with her activities of daily living? Does she remember? No, no to... because she can't walk. Okay. So, so you have to be caring for her? My brother, who is not doing another good job, which is another problem because legally nothing can be done right now because my brother's in denial. He's in poor health. Um, so this is another problem. I can't get, um, what is it called? Um, what's it called? What do you take care of somebody? There's a word for it. Um, oh, power of attorney. I cannot get power of attorney because my brother blocks me. She's not being taken care of correctly, in my opinion. Um, and there's, and I've talked to attorneys. There's nothing I can do about it legally. So, I mean, I've talked to two attorneys and it's just kind of like, I'm just, I, it's not, uh, something needs to be changed with that because there's really legally nothing I can do. Is she still of sound mind? Um, well, I don't think so, but you know, my brother does. And so I don't have any choice. I, I can't do anything. <laughs> yeah. You're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. That's a tough position to be in. Yeah. So she won't sign any paperwork. My brother is, you know, um, enabling her. And, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm kind of like just watching this kind of this horror show right go no go on right now. So it's, it's very difficult, you know. It's very Can I make a suggestion for you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the Alzheimer's Association has, has a toll-free 800 number hotline. Mm -hmm. You can call them and, and explain your situation, and they can either um, give you a direction to go in. Or the other option that I would suggest is to call a geriatric case manager. They're social workers. And in situations like this, they would be able to let you know if you have any options. Mm -hmm. Maybe try that since you haven't had much luck with an attorney, but mm -hmm. are you talking to elder care attorneys by any chance? Uh, my uncle is a um, very prestigious judge. He knows everybody, everybody. So yeah, I already legally, there's not much I can do. <laughs> it's just, I just, it's, my hands are pretty tied. So, but um, well, case I, managers can actually intervene and and go check on her and make. It I am, but then there, there then there's the thing is is it, it's um how can I put this? My mom has like she doesn't want I don't know it, it's I I'm in a hard place because there are certain things that she wants to do or with her care I don't want any of her hating me so then you have that kind of stuff because my mom doesn't want you know the government involved in her business and yeah. she has told me that I will be disowned and. I cut out the will and blah, 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 and you know, and my brother will back her. So it's, it, it gets really, it, families are compl complicated, especially when they are elders. It's, it's really difficult because, you know, no one will agree with stuff and there's certain family members that, and this is not just my family. This happens all the time because I've talked to other friends where you have family members that are fighting about what should happen and then they block things and it's just, it's hard. It's really, it's tough, you know, and I'm not alone in this situation. I I've seen this disease rip families apart just in the same situation, divide into camps, and nobody, this side doesn't agree with this side, and it's just a really um, almost impossible situation. Lisa, I have a question. So since, you, with this stuff in the since you've been in this field for a really long time, do you think... Margaret? Margaret, I said you have to deal with this stuff all the time. And then, sorry, Tosh, go to the U.N. next after that. Don't you in the U.K. Families like that. Um, for, for us, in terms of uh, the people that we actually deal with a lot, I mean, I can understand what Lisa is saying because my mother kind of went through that journey and kind of passed away um, about two years ago. And it is it kind of tears the family apart. Because um, nobody kind of taking that res responsibility, that person is saying, that person is doing. But at the end, that's, it got really, really worse. Then everybody had to come together. So I do understand what you're saying and also listen. Thanks a lot because I kind of so like really have a deep insight as well and have a bit more understanding as well what my mother was going through at that time. But in terms of the work we do with um, the single fathers, a lot of it has a lot to do with the mental health side of it, because um, 
the reason I set up uh, the single father kind of training and focusing on them um, during the COVID, I mean, we've always worked with them, but not at the deep level that we've gone working with them now. During the COVID-19, I um, I was running some workshops. You know, our organization kind of specialized during those days where we get a lot of funding from the government, local authorities over the last 11 years. But throughout our training, um, a lot of the women took over the program. And when the, fu uh, the funding came out, it was all about women. And then um, gradually, we're kind of losing the men at the background. And um, it turned out to be there's not that much um, training provider there, support for single father, particularly for single fathers, because I, I remember contacting quite a few of them, organization nearby, and it says, um, well, and everybody's just going to go quiet. What? Single fathers? And during the COVID-19, which hits a lot of people, our organization, everything needed to change how we run our, our training, which went virtual. And at that time, I was running business startup, coaching, mentoring, and then that changed completely. And I remember I was running the workshop and I kept getting a lot of men being referred. During the last two, three years, we never had a lot of men in the programs. And then gradually, as I was doing the training, we had about 10 men in the training and they weren't talking. And these are single fathers. And all the women were doing all the talking. And I thought, there's something not quite right here because the women, because at that time now, you know, the lockdown is there. They, the children, a lot of them are in the disadvantaged groups in the community, kind of not working in low income, you know. So all those things are coming out. So we were supporting the, um, the women, but the men weren't talking in the program. So at the end of the kind of um, two, three weeks into the training program, I would say, right, okay, ladies, you're going to have to just log off after training and I'm going to speak to the men. And then gradually I spoke to the men. I said, guys, you're not talking. I, I, I do understand that it's a lot of pressure happening out there. And the women, again, all the support. Our organization was giving the women the support, but the men weren't talking, so it was difficult. So at the end, I then find out... Um, Anxiety was part of it, you know, um, depression was part of it, worried about their children, uh, mental health and well-being, because all of a sudden, here they are, they were running a successful business and they had to shut their business and bringing up two children on their own, where they were having support from families, there was no longer support from families and financially it was very, very tight as well. And during that journey with them, I kind of be able to put people around that can give them the support, the financial support, emergency financial support. That was really, really important at the time. And during that process, it was also finding someone I can get them help immediately because some of them really were very anxious and going through a mental breakdown, depression and all that kind of thing. So it was quite tough for the men, the single fathers. And um, that kind of spurs me on to put something on specifically for men. I did get radical about that. People got laugh at me. People asked me, well, why men? You know, and there's actually no facilities there. And one of the things that I've been working with men last year, the beginning of this year, kind of worked with 30 men. And it was um, most of the men that we worked with, it was men that's kind of um, going through separation or they are fighting um, custody with their children, with the, the mother, so they can have custody with the children or share custody with the children. And majority of them had to give up their jobs or their work so that they could kind of go to court or have the child in. So what we now do it's giving them that extra support. If they need to go to court and they don't have anybody, it's kind of uh, paired them up with somebody else who has gone through that journey with them. And during the training, what was so amazing, and I was absolutely very humble because this is um, the first time ever that I have a classroom which was full with men, you know, single fathers. And you're thinking these people actually exist 
in our community and yet they're not recognized, they're not seen, their voice are not being heard. And so what I wanted to do is to change that narrative so that their voice could be heard, their story could be told and everything like that. So throughout the journey, uh, particularly this year, we ran across from the 19th of April to July, where we trained 30 single fathers. And I was very, very humbled by that because the, the journey, the feeling going to court, not being heard, you know, the court not being heard, all the rights are given to the, to the mother, you know, so you can take them three years or more. But what I learned from that group full of men at the time is this, all of a sudden where they felt they were apart, there was nowhere to go. Now they had this safety net where they came and they can share stories, share their journey and support one another. You know, one of the story that kind of really stuck into my head, one of the father was going for the first time to court, to, you know, court hearing in terms of share custody. And I'm like, okay. And one of the guys who's gone through the journey said to him, I'll go with you. You know, he said, I will go with you. And so that build that kind of network together. So what we do now is kind of make sure that continues throughout their journey, giving them that support, whether they're going into business, whether they're going into employment, or they're just generally need day-to-day -day support. But one of the main thing, one of the things they struggle definitely was mental health, quite a lot of that. So this is what we do with that organization. Margaret, I wanted to know a little bit more about the single mother and the dating game because I was wondering, so my mom is a single mother and she refuses to date. And I try to get her, you know, try to get her out of her comfort zone. I try to set up like an online dating thing for her and she hated me for it. But your, is that book like based on how to maneuver, like how to get back into the dating game after <laughs> being married or? <laughs> Why you caught me off that one? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> well, you see that book came about um i kind of split off from my um my last son the father we it's so kind of funny because when we're together nobody took responsibility of the relationship because he had his own business he had his own place I had my own business so i'm kind of very independent and then for some reason um god would have it up both our business kind of um broke down he be, you know just closed you know and so here we are we never really had a conversation per se and then we both sat there in the sitting room looking at one another and saying well this is not gonna work you know because we've never really talked everybody left their separate way so at the end, I realized I couldn't stay in this relationship. Um, and plus, at the same time, I kind of just lost my business. So I need to get myself together. So for about 10 years, I kind of focused on building this business. I'm talking about h and training, professional, working with lone parents and everything. And um, my younger son kind of wanted to be 25 now. And one day he came in and says, you know, mom, I'm going on a date with um, for the weekend. I'm like okay okay you're going what on a day so it's kind of like a shock to me and i kind of panicked i'm like oh my god what am i gonna do my younger son is grown up oh god you know I haven't been on a date for 10 years what do i do what happened and um met a guy went on this date kind of panicked kind of like oh my god what do you do what do you talk about what do i wear do I buy new clothes? Do I know, you know, that panic. And then when we eventually went out, got there, overdressed for the restaurant, that was one. <laughs> and then when we sat on the restaurant, he said to me, well, you order, I have already had my dinner. Oh, that's why. <laughs> what? I hope you got up and left because I would have been like, what, well, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, why are we going on a date I, to a restaurant? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get up. I sat and I said to myself, 
you've got your money, you're hungry, and you're going to sit down, and you're going to order the dinner, and you're going to eat, and you're going to pay. And that's exactly what I did. And when go. I came out, and I thought, <laughs> when I came out, I thought, oh, my God, how many women like me are there kind of we've got we're successful in our own way we our kids are all grown up we manage our own bills what happened to us and the kids are living home you know and hence that's where the book came from and i was so troubled about it so the book really it's about my journey so it's written at the age of 21 then it's read which is carefree then it's running businesses, got children and that kind of thing. Written at 50, because this time now I'm looking at, well, why is my relationships are not working? Not so much about the men, I not need to look at myself. So the book is written. And uh, so at the back of the book, I call it golden age. So where we as women at 50 plus that want to go dating, how do we start preparing? So that experience that I have will never happen again. So I kind of wrote about that and give tips. And um, in terms of your mom, yes, I went to online dating. That was scary. Oh my God. She says the same. But, She's yeah, like, so I don't know who I'm going <laughs> to. But, but the thing about it, we have got from that book, actually. So I thank the guy every day. Because if I didn't go on that day, I wouldn't have written the book. If I didn't go on that day, I would not have done a two years uh, research on online dating. And if I didn't go on that day, I've now got a full program for single parents, golden age that want to go on date and you can go online dating that is safe for you. So I give you practical seven steps because I've done the journey. I've done the scammers. Uh, yeah them all so yeah well so the book yes the book is really good for preparation well, but, good to know. i'm gonna tell my mom to check you. out your book yeah, yeah so um so just so you guys know a little summary of me so last week um i was not on the show because i was in las vegas uh performing at the hard rock for the latin grammy music week which was a huge, huge deal for me because it was my first time performing in Vegas, you know, showcasing my music. I do a lot of urban Latin pop singing. So um, these are some pictures, you know, getting interviewed, which was, we, that's where we were performing outside and it was freezing. It was like 30 degrees outside. And I was like, oh my God, I brought all my Miami clothes here. Like, this is not going to work. But I, but I made it work. I made it work. This is um, another interview that I did. There was so many things going on, like interviews back to back with different medias, podcasts, uh, radio shows, which gave me a lot of exposure. Uh, these were all the artists that were in the showcase with me. This is a fusion Latin band from LA. Um, it was honestly the best. And Tara came to see me. <laughs> This was us on the high roller. And then um, Sarah and Angelica also were there to support me. So it was like such a great week. And I came back so much prepared and, you know, and excited to continue the musical journey, which goes to Howard. How are you preparing for the launch of the Judy Garland fragrance? Tell us. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Oh my God, I'm looking so forward to that event. I've really shined in front of people and I just cannot wait to see y'all, all of you, so. I'm sad because I won't be able to go. I have a wedding oh. that day that I can't, that I cannot <laughs> miss, but I will be there in spirit. Tasha, how could you let me down? <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's okay. We got we got next year. We got lots of events next year. I will see. I will I will see you soon. Okay. <laughs> I I want to say something about our Vegas trip since I was on. I wasn't on the show last week either because I decided I was going to go support Tosh because I think it's it's really important for us to support our co-hosts for Brian. So yes. we we really had a blast. It was the first time that I was able to see Tosh perform, and I want to say I want to give her a compliment. 
in front of everybody that she really knows how to bring the audience in. She knows like a lot of performers, they get out there and, you know, my forte is I do red carpet interviews and she's just, she, she's, you have a, a this smile about you or this aura about you that brings people in, even in your interview. So it was, it was really exciting to see that. And again, like we did get to do some fun things. We went on the high roller that what that was, it's a big wheel from the in front of the Link Hotel, and you can see all of Vegas. And so we were able to go and see the whole skyline of Vegas above all the hotels. And it was just fun to experience it with my girlfriends. Tasha was able to meet one of my best friends that I've been friends with for 20 years, Sarah, um, who came out from San Diego. So it was not only was we it was a kind of a little bonding trip for all of us too. So it was I was glad I got to go. That's all I want to say. I'm glad you came. <laughs> I'm glad you came. It was fun. And I and we I will never forget we smoked a little J for the first time. And I was like, oh my God, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, which I had a question on um this C B D aspect for David Laurie. So when I was over there, um there was this gifting suite and they were getting a lot of like CBD, um, like tinctures, but also chapsticks, which I had no idea that that even existed. And I had such bad, um, my mouth was so dry from all the, like the dry, humid Vegas air. And I didn't even realize CBD could work on your lips, like to fix them. Like, yeah. So yeah, CBD has a lot of healing benefits and um, there are a lot of CBD chapsticks out there now. It's um, very uh, soothing for the skin, for sure. And it's soothing and healing, you know, cannabis is in general. Yeah. So actually our tincture, our Pacific tincture, we tell people you can take it internally, you know, for the most part, that's what people do, but we use it on our skin as well. So for um, various things like rash or pain, um, we can soak into the skin and be beneficial. Yeah. It's really good on the skin for pain. I was going to add that. Just for after my workouts, I have the, I don't have your brand. I'd like to tell you your brand, but I have the, the THC lotions for pain because I've got an injured shoulder. So I always put it on this shoulder after I work out and it's amazing. That's, I mean, it's, Again, better than any pharmaceuticals I've used for pain. So. Yeah, well, you know, cannabis, the great thing about cannabis is that it doesn't really, the side effect mm -hmm. is that if it's a THC um, product, then you might feel euphoria. <laughs> but for the topicals, uh, and that's really like really one of the only side effects for the most part, um, whereas, you know, pharmaceutical drugs will sometimes have side effects. Um, and uh, THC is great topically. I love using THC products topically. And when you use it topically, um, you don't get high from that experience. Like it doesn't soak in through your bloodstream because it's more of a, it's on the surface. It stays on the surface of your skin more and it doesn't make you, it doesn't give you that euphoric feeling that it would if you were um, taking it internally or smoking it or, you know, so yeah, so it's pretty cool. It's very helpful for pain and arthritis. Um, yeah, and actually, um, you know, going back to what uh, Lisa, um, you know, was talking about with um, Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, I had a grandmother who had dementia quite, bad you know in the last five years of her life she lived to be 99 but um yeah and so you know just uh i wasn't around her very much but um because she was in scotland so i wasn't able to visit her too often but um you know when i did you know it was just like this gradual process i would talk to her on the phone and she was losing her memory but um i've read some articles about cannabis being beneficial for alzheimer's and dementia and the research is ongoing right now, but there's some hopeful research around that. And they've been checking out CBD and THC separately. They're finding that the combination of the two, THC and CBD, work better together for Alzheimer's and dementia. But there's been several studies that are showing that that might be promising medicine. So it helps, um, I guess it's preventative somewhat it slows down the process supposedly and then also it just helps with the symptoms 
um, as well, but it slows the um, the cellular breakdown that happens. I think it's like the myelination or something that breaks down in the nervous system and it slows that process down from happening apparently. So we'll see what happens as, you know, researchers kind of look at that more and kind of discover, we'll see. And as far as research goes, um, you know, Joe Biden had just announced earlier this year that he's looking for doing some descheduling of cannabis within our nation. And what really opens, what really happens with that, it opens a door for FDA research. So I think that we're going to start seeing a real strong barrage of all sorts of ailments that cannabis is going to be good for because it's finally going to be able to be studied at a national level and be able to be, you know, FDA approved on certain things. And I think like people have been like, look at cannabis as like, oh, it's that drug that gets you high, but there's just so many medical benefits to it. And, you know, the um, TH, there's really like in cannabis, there's over 130 or about, about 127, something like that, cannabinoids that have been discovered up until this point. So cannabinoids, um, you know, there are these molecules that uh, bind to our cells' receptors. We have receptors on our cell membranes that the cannabinoids join into, and that helps relieve certain ailments. And they're in our central nervous system, the CB1 receptors, and then more in the peripheral nervous system is the CB2 receptors. Um, and THC binds to the CB1 receptor and, T and CB2 receptor. Um, the CB1 receptor is what causes that euphoric feeling. CBD just binds to the CB2 receptor. And so it has medical benefits, but it's not uh, binding to the CB1 receptor, which creates that euphoric feeling. Which that euphoric feeling, there's a place for that too with um pain relief and um and whatnot so yeah so it's exciting to um to know that there's hopefully going to be more research in the coming years and that um you know, we can learn more about our endocannabinoid system people who might have a deficient endocannabinoid system they can find benefit from taking uh cannabinoids and um, when our own bodies aren't producing them as they should be. Where can we find um, you guys on, on Instagram or on Facebook? Uh, both Facebook and Instagram will be at Sunrise Mountain Farms. And our website is sunrisemountainfarms.com. Awesome. And Lisa, where can we get your social media? Where can we get in touch with you? I have a blog on Facebook that is called Not All Who Wander Need Be Lost. So I post a lot of helpful information, um, resourceful information on there. And then my website is www.truthliesalzheimers.com. And I'm on LinkedIn too, under Lisa Skinner. Amazing. Now, Margaret. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> you can find us at Facebook at HR Training Professional.co.uk. You can find us at LinkedIn as well. In terms of the program that we run specifically for the men, you can find us at um, www.let's change your life with Margaret Thorley, Margaret Thorley .com. And you can get the book there as well. <laughs> <Single> <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And then you can find me at Vocally Tosh on all social media platforms. Uh, take a listen to my newest single called Dime Una Cosa. And we'll end the show with Terry. Yeah, you can find me on uh, Terry Marie Nonstop on all platforms. And then my website is uh, terrymarieofficial.com. Um, and now I have been signed with Influencer. Um, uh, influencer. Oh. It's an agency out of Tampa, so I'm going to be doing more influencing stuff. Um, I just signed with them last week. So, yay me. <laughs> Money. <laughs> well, I want to congratulate everybody for coming out.
And with that, you know, I want to thank everybody. So I always say this. Have a, a better day tomorrow. If you see someone about a smile, please give them one of yours. I'm Brian Bash, and this will be producing more. We'll see you next time. Hi, guys. Okay. Good luck.